Hello, this is View to Echo Sugar Echo, and this is a video on designing feedback amplifiers. We will experiment with the feedback amplifiers, and I assume that you already know how to solder and understand the very basics of electronics like current voltage and gains. Now, the feedback amplifiers are a very marvelous uh, but fairly simple uh, electronic circuit. And their advantage over the regular amplifiers is that the gain is predictable. Okay, so the gain is known. Uh, they are very stable. Uh, they do not oscillate, unlike the other amplifiers. Uh, they are easy to build. That's the most important part of these amplifiers. But there's a challenge that they need to be terminated properly. But we'll see why that matters soon. Okay. Uh, now, while talking about the feedback amplifiers, I'm going to talk very little bit of theory. Um, and this theory is going to be based on lies. Okay. Um, what often happens is that the actual model to predict what a transistor will do in an amplifier uh, needs you to understand quantum mechanics and the quantum theory, etc., etc. And it's really, really intricate. But if we limit ourselves to say that we are going to operate only in the HF band, uh, we are going to have about less than, let's say, 500 milliwatts of power. We are going to operate only on 50 ohms impedance in and out. And if we make these assumptions, then the design becomes very simple. Okay, if you'd like to go beyond what's being covered in this lecture, then I would suggest that you buy the, the experimental methods and RF design, which is an ARRL handbook for more details about the feedback amplifiers. I have learned most of this from this book. Uh, it's a good buy. Uh, you won't regret it. Okay, so um, now the feedback amplifier, as opposed to regular amplifier, is something like this. Now first, a regular amplifier. In a regular amplifier, there is a input which comes, a signal is generated, and this signal generator has a driving impedance, Rn, which is fed to the uh, amplifier, and on the output, which is the, you put up a load, and you get a greater signal out of here, which is mostly in terms of voltages, which is how we do the regular amplifiers, right? Now what happens in a feedback amplifier is a little of this output is fed back to the input through another resistor, which you call as a feedback resistor. All right, that's all there is to it really. Um, one key thing which you have to realize here, and I have not really drawn anything here, I'll come to that in a little bit, is that when the voltage here goes up, okay, when the voltage here goes up, more current flows through this than earlier, which results in more current, far more current going through this resistor. And as the current through this resistor increases, and on this end of the resistor, we have fixed this to a positive voltage. So it can, when the voltage across this increases, it only falls here. So when the voltage here goes up, the voltage here comes down, right? The instantaneous voltages of, a, of the signal. So it's called an inverting amplifier. That is, as this goes up, this goes down. As this comes down, this goes up, etc. The, the thing about the feedback amplifier is best understood like a lever. So imagine that you have the Rn here and you have the Rf here. And imagine that this is the base of this transistor here. So as this goes up, this would come down. Now you can actually figure this out if you think that there's a voltage coming up here and there's a voltage going down here and this is a resistive divider of sorts. So the voltage here will go up until the voltage which has come down here of, you know, the opposing voltages sort of balance out around this point. So this is exactly how it happens. and. This ratio determines the voltage gain of this particular amplifier. Okay. Now, in the RF, we're not concerned much with the voltage gains, but with the power gains. All right. 
So I'll, I'll switch the next stage uh, part of it. First is imagine that this RF to RN will determine the, the voltage gain. Now, when you take a transistor and feed in a signal of RN or ZN or whatever you call it, input impedance, and you have a feedback resistor here. Now we all know that the, the emitter follows the base. So whatever voltage is here, if it goes up, the emitter also goes up. And here, if we consider that there's a resistor here and the current in this resistor is also increasing, and most of this current in this resistor actually is coming in over this. Very little of it actually comes in from the base. So as this resistors, the voltage on this resistor increases, so does the voltage on this resistor drop down. Okay, And the current flowing between both of them is the same. So just as we had this ratio here, you will see that the same ratio operates here because the current is the same. And if the, if the voltage here, this V in here is also being reflected here and the V out and V in are uh, controlled by this ratio R, RF is, is to RN, then also the RN and uh, RL which is load and E will also move in the same ratio. So this is the magic formula for making a feedback amplifier which is simply that RF by RN should be equal to RL by RE. Now, as long as you stick to this, your feedback amplifiers will work well. I mean, this is a starting point. Uh, there are um, the, the 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 maths for this is a little more, little more uh, complicated. We will not get into that maths right now. But this is is just about um, how these ratios ought to be. You should also understand that this RE here includes a resistance which is inside the transistor. So the transistor inside has a small resistance which is much smaller than this resistance that we are talking about here. And all these resistances that we are talking about here are actually not resistances but impedances are actually RF imp impedances. So this, these we will determine to figure out what the RF gain is but we also need to connect it to a power supply to give some positive voltage here so that the current starts flowing into this and the transistor switches on. And the amount of current which has to flow this into this is also important because more the current, the smaller the internal resistance. So given all this, let's start by building a very simple amplifier. Now this amplifier, uh, let's imagine that this is going to have 20 milliamps of current. Okay. Uh, so what we will do is, let's say we put a 1K resistor here as a feedback resistor. And our input is of course being driven by 50 ohms source here. So I'm just putting a capacitor here to isolate this. So this is how I will actually put my signal generator or whatever the signal source here, which is a 50 ohms resistor in series with a voltage source which is going up and down uh, at your RF frequency. Right now this is being connected through, a, through an inductor, a high value inductor to 12 volts. Okay. Now, if we imagine that through this we want, let's say, 20 milliamps of current to flow through this. Okay. And let's imagine that we pick up a resistor like 150 ohms here. So 150 ohms would actually mean that 150 into 0.2 is about 3 volts. So we will have about 3 volts of voltage here, which means that this volt, the between base and emitter, there's always half a volt difference, is going to be about 3.5 volts, or let's say approximately 4 volts, and which means if we put a 470 ohms resistor here, this 12 volts, which is also coming up till here, gets divided in 2 to 1 ratio, and you get approximately 4 volts here. So this is a DC bias. However, in our design, we said that this 50 ohms to 1K ratio should also be maintained here. So imagine that this is going to be connected to a 200 ohms load here. Okay, let's imagine that this is going to be connected to a 200 ohms load here. In which case, your 1000 to 50 ratio should also be matched by 200 to something else here, which is what this resistance ought to be, but this is already 150 ohms. So what we could do is this 
question mark here turns out to be 10 right so that this is 1 to 20 and this is also 1 to 20 what this this uh, what this resistor should have been for rf purpose is about 10 ohms the way to do it is that you just put a capacitor and put a 10 ohms in parallel with the 150 ohms 150 is too high uh, so the parallel uh, resistance is still about 10 ohms so that's how this is done however our output that we are going to measure and drive to the next part of the circuit has to be 50 ohms and this is 200 ohms so we can actually use a center tapped inductor which is also transformer and here this can be connected to a 50 ohms loop so this is our entire design of the feedback amplifier and this is how we have come to this design I'll just repeat this once more that we have picked up a feedback value such that the ratio of the feedback to the input is same as that of the load to the emitter degeneration resistor as this is called and then we tap this down so that the output and the input are both 50 ohms so this concludes a very basic and simple way of designing a feedback amplifier within the limits of this being a small transistor we're just doing hf for example when we come to vhf etc you would imagine that there are small resistances here that this uh, resistor here would probably also look like an inductor in series with this etc etc and you might actually have capacitances between these two ends etc so but we are not going to deal with those right now we'll just deal with where we imagine that the resistor is only a resistor and its capacitance effect is minimal and its inductive um, effect of its leads are minimal etc because we're dealing with hf HF actually provides you with a very convenient and sweet point at which you can experiment with RF but you're not too bothered with the vagaries of uh, resistors which act as inductors and wires that act as capacitors etc. So that's the, that's the design part of it. Now what we are going to do here is that uh, I am going to introduce uh, this little uh, instrument, it's called Antuino, which I have designed, um, which is an RF lab of sorts in a box. You can homebrew this yourself and I will tell you where to find the details about this. It's actually going to be available on my website, which is VU um, on VU2ESC, which is my call sign, dot com. So in a day's time or two, I'll have this up about the Antuino. The Antuino can also be bought, uh, ready built from HF Signals website. Okay, hfsignals.com. So you could also buy it from there. So these are the two sources. In case you would like to homebrew, you do this. In case you would like to buy it. Now I'll just show you what the Antuino does. So uh, I'm op I operate my Antuino on batteries. So as you can see that you when you press here, you get... A menu where you can set a frequency it's like a spectrum analyzer and you can set the central frequency which is set to about 13.96 right now uh, find out the span and on that span it will actually scan either SWR or it will um, find out the uh, or it will scan uh, an RF in or it can also do a sweep generator like a tracking generator uh, like a spectrum analyzer with a tracking generator one more thing which I did and I've, I've done this to my own hack is that I have added a I have added a voltmeter to this so that I can also check all the voltages uh, on the system itself and now how we use this is something that we will find out as we go ahead with building the amplifier and after that testing it up so let's start building the amplifier now I'll switch this off for the time being uh, the way I build most of my stuff is that I just build this on simple copper clad boards and I just solder the components on top of this this is the sort of system which was actually pioneered by Wes Hayward and Roger Hayward uh, when they build their ugly weekender transmitter now this system all that looks ugly and um, uh, it doesn't look very beautiful to look at which is why it's called ugly it's actually uh, very convenient first but more importantly it is 
good from an RF perspective because this entire thing is, you know, your ground plane and all your connections directly go onto the ground without it having a sort of a lead or an inductance which leads to the ground, right? So all the connections are short and direct here. So we will build this with a, a 2N3904 transistor. That's the transistor that we will use and we'll build this here now. Okay. Uh, whenever I start to build an amplifier, I, I actually uh, use the BNC connectors and I've standardized on BNC connectors. As you can see that even here, I've got this BNC lead. So I have actually pre-built about half a dozen of these cables with me, which I use at all times. So um, first thing which goes down is actually the two connectors on for the input and the output and the DC connector. So let's first put those in. So this on this side will be the input. I'm just putting a block of solder here and pressing this down. So this is now our RF input. And then somewhere here, I could, I could have put it in here, but it's, it's too long. I mean, you know, our circuit is much smaller than that. So about here is where I will connect another of the BNC connectors. And what I do here, if you see here, is that these BNC connectors are pre-soldered with these 0.1 microfarad capacitors. 0.1 microfarad capacitors are the most often used component uh, in a home brewer's lab for uh, HF work. And I have a large box of about 500 to 1000 of them, which I've bought and surplus and I keep them with me. So now, the way the ugly is built is you first solder down the components which have to go onto the ground and then mount the rest of the components on top of that. So there's a 150 ohms resistor here, which I'll have to put down. Let me just see if I have a 150 ohms resistor lying somewhere or I'll have to pull that, pull it out of the res resistor box. It's probably easier to just put it out. Uh, in my box, I usually keep um, just a few values of resistors and when I need some other odd value, uh, I just parallel or serial uh, or serially connect the resistors to get them. But I do get by with very few values really. Um, so I have uh, here in my box 5 ohms, 10 ohms, 22 ohms, 100 ohms, 220, 470 ohms, 1K, 2.2K, 4.7K, 10K and 100K. Those are the values that I you know, usually work with. Okay, so first what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this 150 ohms, uh, the 10 ohms and the 470 ohms in here. And uh, uh, very often we tend to leave the leads out in these circuits, but actually it's not a good idea because um, more than long leads, they actually lead to shorts, which might actually stop the circuit from working properly. So I usually trim these out. Uh, and these actually become very useful, these pigtails of sorts, you know, one always makes use of. So the 150 ohms has gone in, the 10 ohms will come next to that, this one. So I'm going to put that in as well now. So that's the 10 ohm here. So the 10 ohm has gone in, right? We have the 10 ohms here. Then we also have a capacitor between these two, which is a 0.1 ohm capacitor. Let me just pull out a couple of these 0.1s here so that I can just keep using them one after the other. You see now what happens with the ugly is that one of the key things is that you can always keep making changes to the circuit that you have done. I, what I usually do is when I have soldered it, I give it a couple of seconds and I give it a tug to see whether the capacitor has actually, uh, the component has really stuck on there or not. And this is actually a fairly um, sturdy way of doing things. These really become very sturdy. You know, I have actually built uh, stuff which has gone into space with this and it's lasted very well. So these are actually fairly sturdy ones. Now, this part is done. I'm going to put the 470 ohms in here. 
So there's 470 ohms coming up. That's 470 ohms and I'm going to put that in here as well. There's your 470 ohms. Right, <clears throat> now we'll put in the transistor itself, which is the uh, 2N3907. I don't know whether you can read it here, but these days uh, when, you know, some of these component values are actually too, um, too uh, small for me to see, I, you, I take a picture of it on my phone and I'm recording this also on the phone and then enlarge it to see what's written there. Uh, okay, now the 2N3904 uh, is a very odd transistor because one's usually told that it's emitter base collector, but in case of a 2N3904, it's the other way around. This is the emitter and this is the base and collector and I make this mistake very often, very, very often, too often to be, um, you know, it's, it's actually quite shameful of about how many transistors I've actually blown up just because I did not remember that the 2N3904's pin orders are reversed. See, this is, okay, yeah, it's sort of stuck all right, but not really very well. Uh, and then the base goes in here. The good thing about the ugly is that it's so easy to bend things all around and solder them up and you know, yet it, it, it works very well RF-wise. RF-wise is absolutely no problem at all, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So actually, um, for, for the feedback amplifiers, the thing is that the feedback, this resistor basically hangs between two leads of the transistor, which is why it's always good to first put down a base mm -hmm. uh, transistor there and then put the feedback, which is the 1K the resistor, between these two like that. So that's what we're going to do, do now, so that the resistor can actually hang on to one side. So this is on the base side. I'm actually now in reverse here, reverse direction, and I need to just pull this in together here. Yeah, that way. So there. Uh, so there I'm done. Here, I just have to add this that, you know, it's always good to decouple this. It's very important to decouple this. Uh, in fact, on uh, w7zoi.net, uh, uh, there's a very good article on, on the importance of choosing these uh, decoupling capacitors. It's a very good read. Okay, so now we are done with almost all the resistors and capacitors as well. And now we can basically connect the input here. So the input goes in there. There's too much of glare there and I can't see this thing properly anyway. Yeah, okay. And this is, I actually, uh, whenever I have spare time, I build a lot of these um, tri trifler wound uh, transformers together because they actually take a lot of time to build. And once I have them, uh, then I just uh, use them in a box. So I have about you know, 50, 60 of these actually built. And some of them are actually from the HF signals production runs. But nevertheless, I always tend to test them out once. So yeah, these are one side and this is the secondary winding this time that I'm not going to use. So I'm just going to use this side. There's, a, there's another winding here which we are not going to use. So it's just these three on this side. I've just pulled them out onto the side so that you can see this. Um, so I solder this. This end has been soldered. Now the other end I'll have to solder now. And what I'm going to do is I'm also going to attach the power supply here. So the power is coming up here. That's a 
power line all right and this has to be bypassed the other end of this transformer has to be bypassed which is what i'm doing now so you see it's taking me about hardly five minutes or so to actually build this entire stage uh, we're almost done now all right and then i put this in here that's the bypass seems to be fine uh, now finally the trans uh, a resistor has to go in from here to the positive which is another 10 ohms resistor the good thing about you know standardizing this stuff for example that you always use a 10 ohms resistor unless the current is too high is that you don't think about it once you have decided that you're doing this stuff uh, to a particular voltage and to a particular impedance All right, so that I am done. Yeah, that seems to be working as well. I'll cut out these extra leads here. I'll just leave these two here because, um, you know, at times, let me actually just see if I can enlarge this a little. Yeah. Okay, there you go. So. There you have the entire thing built. This will connect up here because it's going onto the center tap here, right? So uh, this will connect up here. So let me solder that. And then we are done with the, with the amplifier. And next we can just test out this amplifier and I'm going to actually spend quite some time testing it because this actually demonstrates a lot of principles uh, of, um, of RF electronics. Uh, which is why I chose the feedback amplifier as a test case for ourselves. Okay, the first thing that you do when you build a build any particular stage is to do the DC checks. And what we decided was that the most important thing that I usually check for here is let me just uh, sorry yeah the most important thing that I I figured uh, when you build an amplifier is to test the voltage on the emitter, the DC voltage on the emitter, because you know what this resistor is. And if this voltage here is coming properly, it means that the bias is proper and that the uh, the bias voltage and current of the transistor are proper. So that's actually one uh, neat way of doing that. So now we will kick in with our Antuino. All right, I switch this on and I go to the, I'm using this basically as a multimeter right now and this VTVM is the one that is going to show me. And what I do is that with my regular uh, multimeter also I actually have an extra pair of uh, leads in which uh, the negative is connected with an alligator clip which I can plug in here so that I don't have to use two hands to hold this and I've actually fashioned the positive probe of this multimeter made out of this Arduino which is inside it with a ball pen nib here and I'm going to now power this up is it showing some? Okay. So there we go. Okay. Now let's see what the voltage here is like first. No, there's there doesn't seem to be any voltage here. Probably there's a problem with my power supply somewhere. Let me check here. No, there doesn't seem to be any voltage here at all. Okay, let me just try another power supply line. All right. So here, I'll check this and see that we have 12.14 volts here. The most important thing is here. So let me just see how much that is going here. So it's about 3.192 volts almost the predicted voltage and the base will be about 0.6 volts more than that so it's about 3.876 volts or whatever i mean you know one really doesn't care for the finer 
things about this. Okay, so now we have here uh, a fairly uh, good and stable uh, DC bias going. I'm just trying to wonder why uh, this guy didn't work, the other power supply lead, because I will need both of them very shortly. But anyway, now, so given this, there are a number of things now which I can demonstrate right here and I will proceed one by one with that, all right? So, but before all that, I just wanted to introduce a couple of things about the Antuino itself. And more specifically, it's just not Antuino, actually you could use any of your antenna analyzers to do this, which is the SWR, okay? So I've chosen the SWR mode and I exit out of the menu so that it actually starts sweeping now. So you see there's a sweep going on here and it's and the return loss is about 0 dB, which means that every all the signal that it's sending out from this lead here is actually going back, going back here. It's just being reflected back here and none of the power is actually able to escape out of here. So that's happening because uh, it's not connected to any load. What I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate a little bit about the SWR to you here before we proceed to doing the amplifier itself. So what I'm going to do is momentarily I will desolder the connection to the amplifier and just tell you about this guy here uh, and use just one port to demonstrate the SWR business. I'm just going to put a small dot of solder here and in my arsenal of various things that I do, the most important is this resistor. So they're basically 200 ohms resistors in parallel. It gives me 50 ohms here. So I'm just going to solder it here to demonstrate how the SWR works. It's actually very illuminating to do this test even on a regular SWR uh, meter or if you have the nano VNA or whatever, right? So I'm now going to connect this. Uh, this is the RFN here. The RFN here is being connected in here. And as you can see, the the return loss is still zero dB. That is everything that we are giving is coming back. And the moment I touch this here, you will see that it has gone down to 37 dB there, right? And the SWR has jumped to one, which means that it's a perfect match. And all this, all the power coming in from here is being absorbed by this resistor. Now, if I take this off, okay, uh, the SWR is back to 99 and the return loss is zero dB. Now, if I actually use another resistor, for example, a 100 ohms resistor. In play, in, instead of that, I just use a regular 100 ohms resistor, which is about twice the impedance of this. Now let's see what happens. So I will just momentarily solder this here. Right, it's 100 ohms, and when I connect this in here, right? Uh, let me actually look at there. So you will see that. Let me actually solder this up. So it's it'll go to about 2 dB of, uh, the SWR has gone to 2, which is that it was expecting 50, but it turns out to be 100. So the ratio is 1 to 2, which is why the SWR is showing 2, and the return loss is 8 dB. That is, you know, uh, that about 8 dB of it is actually going back, uh, and now all of it is going back, right? So. Uh, it's only when the match is perfect that you will get a good uh, return loss. This is very important even for an amplifier because more often than not, there's a question asked about what is the impedance of this amplifier, input or output, and that's actually one of the key things that we will see right now. But before that, uh, uh, by the way, there is something very interesting. Uh, uh, let me actually take a break for, and talk about this as well. So you've seen that, for example, this is a 50 ohms load. And if I connect this 50 ohms load here, right? And I connect it in here like that. So uh, there's a full loss. But what happens if I connect something um, and, and the loss is all, all, way, all across the spectrum, right? But what happens if I connect something to this with uh, has reactants, which means, for example, something like this guy. Okay, so this is a uh, this is a 12 megahertz 
crystal. So if I put this 12 megahertz crystal here, okay, and connect it back to the 50 ohms here. Now, let me actually, it's not soldered in properly. No. My problem is that I run my soldering iron a little hotter than usual. Uh, for than is usual that is not at 360 degrees but at uh, 410 degrees Celsius. So actually, um, a lot of times, if you do not hold the component steady, uh, it doesn't get soldered properly. But on the other hand, it actually solders very quickly. So you see that there's return loss here. But if I actually go down to uh, about 14.3 uh, oh this is a 12 I'm so sorry this is a 12 megahertz crystal so let me just go back to 12 uh, okay 12 12 12 okay I have dialed in 12 here press again so, okay so you see that small blip here you see that small blip here right that's actually showing you that uh, the return loss has actually uh, dipped down to about you know 1 dB there but what I can do is if I just hold on to this here for a while this will actually jump exactly to that frequency there and I will actually uh, zoom in to about 10k now let's see actually what this shows so you see here now there is actually a dip here and the dip is actually fairly significant it's almost giving you an almost once to one SWR because at that frequency the RF energy is going from here and getting absorbed by the 50 ohms but that's not what's happening around here so what you're seeing here is a dip and the better the quality of the crystal the deeper is the dip going to be so you can actually measure the Q of tuned circuits by just looking at the SWR which it generates when you've put it in series with a 50 ohms resistor you know this was just an aside but I thought it was an interesting experiment for us to do okay now the other thing is this that in a lot of these instruments, you have to be very careful about what their uh, what their uh, limitations are. So here, uh, with this, if you see that the uppermost line here is about minus 10 dB, and this guy here, the RF out when we put it into this mode is also about minus 10 dB. So once it amplifies and it gives you a greater signal, that signal is going to get it's going to completely overload this instrument. So you need to put an attenuator in place on the output in order to measure this. So I have actually fashioned a small attenuator here. This is actually very interesting. So this is 50 ohms, 50 ohms, and there's a 2.2K. So uh, very simply, this is a 39 dB attenuator. There is 50 ohms, 50 ohms. This should have been actually 51 ohms, but this is all I had. And this is about... 2.2k okay so this is a 39 db um, attenuator which i'll actually add here so that this instrument does not get uh, overloaded and whatever measurement we are going to make for the output we have to remember that we have to add another 39 db to it while while we are doing the absolute measurements so i let me put the 39 db attenuator here now if you actually see this and the ease with which I am able to uh, take these decisions to put attenuator on and take stuff out and you know in the meantime go and do something else interesting this is all possible only when you're building things in the ugly way and it's really not possible if you had a PCB to uh, build things with okay now I've put the attenuator in and I am going to add the output of the RF amplifier to the attenuator okay So uh, that's the capacitor there. I'll add another capacitor here uh, from the attenuator. Actually, I don't even need a capacitor because this is at ground. There's already an isolating capacitor at the other end. But nevertheless, just to keep things simple, I'm going to attach back a capacitor to this. So now there's a 39 dB attenuator, which is in series with the amplifier's output and now we will measure how well the amplifier is doing okay so there we go 
right and what we do now is we take this input plug it in here and the output is here and now you see that uh, this is at about minus 65 dBm so if I actually take this out the output is going to fall right so it's fallen to 103 dB and if I actually put this back on it's gone to minus 65 dBm <clears throat> so let me actually put on a fresh sheet of paper because we have to be doing a lot of writing work now so we are measuring about minus 65 dBm even before we have switched this on uh, so this is minus 65 plus 39 dB because this is a pad so uh, this is about minus 45 minus 46 dBm so the minus 10 dB which is coming in from here okay is turning out to be about minus 46 dBm here so there is about a 36 dB uh, so the minus 10 dB dBm has actually become here uh, sorry uh, minus 26 26 minus 26 dBm so uh, there is a minus 16 dB isolation from here to there so up the 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 signal which is leaking in here even when this amplifier is not on is about minus 60 dB so it's right now acting as an attenuator and now we will plug in the power supply and then we will see how it jumps up okay so here we go there so now it's gone up to minus 32 dBm so it's minus 32 dBm uh, is what it's going to gone up you'll have to add plus 39 to this uh, so this is giving about approximately plus 7 dBm output for a minus 10 dBm input right so this was in was uh, the input was this much and the output is this much so your gain here power gain uh, the power gain here is uh, 7 minus of minus 10 which is about 17 dB dB so 17 dB is the gain of this amplifier right now it's actually very much within the predicted uh, parameters so we found out the gain now we can actually also find out how it is doing frequency wise now this is actually a very small span as we saw but let's increase the span and see how this fares uh, at a higher span so let's say uh, you know around 40 megahertz and I will put the span as uh, the maximum that this goes to which is about 30 uh, meg so now you see that the amplifiers response all the way from 55 megahertz where it is minus 47 dBm to uh, 26 where it's minus 47 dBm is almost the same it's really flat it's really flat and this flatness is because it's a feedback amplifier if it was not a feedback amplifier you wouldn't see this flatness here at all let's actually go much higher and see what happens there so uh, let's say about at 100 megahertz let's see what the gain is there now like now you see here there's a very interesting thing happening which is that <clears throat> there's sort of a jump here and I don't know why this jump is happening but still here <coughs> it is minus 48 dBm even across here into the VHF range and this uh, it will actually uh, increase rapidly as we saw here the output was minus 32 at HF and it's gone down to about minus 55 dBm here and as you keep coming down uh, the frequency the gain is going to go up so let me actually come down here to about you know okay about 18 megahertz plus minus you know plus minus 15 so you see here it's back to uh, 30 oh, no it should have been actually higher so let me actually see what's happening here okay so um, now next thing that we will find out is the input and output impedances of this particular circuit so let me do that now so uh, we expect we were saying that uh, that this here is at 50 ohms so is it actually at 50 ohms we'll figure out so what we will do is very simply we'll connect the 
RF in here, but this time what we are going to do is we are going to measure the SWR, right? And we'll go back to our uh, frequency of choice, which is around 14, uh, 13 megahertz. Then we you know, just step up a little more. No, sorry. Uh, step up to about 14, yeah. So I'll say okay now. And let me actually decrease the span. The span is actually very huge, so that should be actually. Right. So you see here the SWR is 1.04 and the return loss is about 15 dB, which is actually a very good deal. But I'll, now there is something very interesting about the feedback amplifiers and I had hinted about this earlier, which is that the input impedance here depends on the output impedance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this pad away. Now this pad actually provides a very strong 50 ohms impedance termination because there's a 50 ohms resistor right here at the, at the, at the input of the pad itself. So if I take this out, watch this guy jump. So here you'll see that the SWR has gone up to three and the return loss is just 5 dB, it's a bad match. Which is why you would see that in a lot of circuits, the feedback amplifier is always followed by a small pad. Now, if you have a 17 dB gain here, and that's followed by a pad which is you know, losing another 39 dB, it's, it's a useless amplifier. In fact, it's putting the signal down. On the other hand, if you have a smaller pad of about 6 dB here, so even then 17 dB minus six, you still have 11 dB of useful gain, but the most important thing there is, that the input impedance is then back with a very robust uh, match here, which means that if you follow this up with a crystal filter and the crystal filter needs a 50 ohms termination here, that would not happen unless you have put a pad here or there's a resistor in the, in the, in the collector's load instead of a coil, which gives a solid uh, and a definite impedance. So this is actually one of the key things which you have to understand about most of the amplifiers, which is that the amplifier's impedance, when they say that it's a particular impedance, it's, it's not guaranteed to be that. And in this case, we saw that the input impedance is being controlled uh, and varying by the output load. And this actually is a direct result of those two ratios that we were talking about, where we have, were now changing the RL here by taking this out. The RL had become infinite. So that's why this thing was being reflected here. So uh, the the... The key thing about the feedback amplifier is that the termination has to be very good. Okay, now how do you measure the output termination? The output termination measuring is actually not very different from the way you measure the input termination, which is here again, which is you actually, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to now take the pad out because the pad will always provide a good termination. And I just take this pad out of the circuit. And I'm just going to solder these two capacitors together so that the output is now directly connected here to, right? So the output is now directly connected here. The pad is actually out of it there. I have moved the pad out as well. So I'm going to connect this here and I'm going to power this on. Now, as I power this on, you will see that the, the, the termination is not really 50 ohms and it's giving a 3 dB loss here. A 3 dB loss is a bad loss. This is happening because you do not have a good and strong termination at this end either. So what we will have to do is to terminate it properly, I use this 50 ohms load here and I connect it to the input of the amplifier this time. Oops. My God, something is burning up. Oh, all right, sorry, sorry. I'm shorting these circuits here badly. I can actually smell the resistor, which is burnt up there. That's okay. We're almost done with this. So there's a 50 ohms here, right? And now watch this. This is 3 dB here. And if I actually short this back here, oops, it's not coming in here. I have to. Okay, so the moment I actually connect this 50 ohms termination at the input, you see that 
Return loss has gone up to 14 dB and my match is almost perfect at the SWR being 1. So this is happening here because uh, the output termination impedance is not perfectly matched provided the input impedance was perfectly matched. So this is actually the big takeaway of feedback amplifiers that you have to see to it that the impedances on either of the sides is perfectly matched and one way of doing that really is by putting an attenuation pad at the output of the resistor of the amplifier. If you put it at the input of the amplifier what's going to happen is that the signal which is coming in will drop in its level and the noise signal to noise ratio is going to go up. So it's always better to put this at the output of the amplifier. Right now let me actually go back to measuring power here for a second uh, and there's something else that we need to now measure which is the distortion and for distortion I will actually introduce another uh, let me first put this back here okay so I've connected this on here again the RF has been connected but now I'm going to actually feed the the amplifier with two tones I hope that this power works here the, there's some problem with the okay yeah, it seems to be working All right so this uh, box here actually has is very simple inside <coughs> so it basically has two uh, two trans two uh, crystal oscillators you can see one crystal here and the other crystal here and it's amplified through one transistor amplifier the circuit of this is again available at vu2ese.com uh, and both of them are combined here through a hybrid combiner and there's a low pass filter and through that there is an output here and this output is again uh, fixed at minus 10 dBm and now I am going to connect this output oh, oh one second one second sorry in order to prevent it from loading I need to connect the attenuator back so I'll just put the attenuator back here it's pretty hot right now so I'm routing the signal again back through the attenuator. There, done. Uh, and then I will connect this two-tone signal generator which is here in my box here. I'll just keep it here and I will power on my... Right. Uh, now the two tones are actually uh, very close to 14.030 and 14.177. I've actually written them down here so that I don't forget it and this is the date on which I actually measured it and this is where I will get my distortion. I'll, I'll just walk you through those one by one. So I'll just get this first near to where we need this to be. Uh, okay, somewhere about there. But this has to actually be at 14. So, 14. Yeah. Okay, so here what we will do is I'll make this up to 300k. And now you can see that these are the two uh, signals uh, I can move this cursor here and you can see this this one is at about 14.033 and the other one is at about 14.181 meg uh, megahertz so uh, I'm just going to move this past here and go around here and hold this down so that we jump to that as a memory location all right and then I say okay again so now you see here there's a small pip which has appeared here Right, there's a small pip which has appeared here and actually if this is a result of if I actually uh, turn uh, one of the signals off then actually disappears. So this is actually a result of the other two tones mixing together and if you know the ratio between these two which is here uh, if you see this this is at coming through the uh, through the attenuator this signal is about minus 31 plus 39 so it's same it's about almost 8 dBm right plus 8 dBm is the signal which is coming out here and 
the signal just coming out here, which is its destroyer IP3 product, is about. Uh, let me see the what's the maximum I can get here. It's about minus minus 66, minus 66 again plus 39 of to account for the uh, attenuator. So this is about mm, 26. Uh, to 24, 20, yeah, it's about minus 25 dB. So that's the difference between these two signals, right? So this was at uh, minus 31 and this is at minus 66. No, oh, sorry, this is actually going to be more. Uh, 31 to 66 is about 35, 35 dB. Actually, 35 dB is the difference between the two signals. And uh, so <clears throat> the I'm sorry, uh, I'm messing this up. Wait. So we saw that the signal was minus 31 dB M, the main signal, and this signal is minus 66 dB M. So the difference between these two is about 35 dB. And this signal, the absolute value of this signal is about uh, minus 31 plus, uh, this is minus 31 plus 39, which is about uh, 8 dB. So 8 dB M was the, the tone itself and the uh, uh, distortion and the distortion here the distortion here uh, was 35 dB down so the uh, the output intercept point 3 for this is plus 8 and half of this plus 35 by 2 which comes to about 35 by 2 is about uh, 17 so 8 plus 17.5 approximately uh, which actually comes down to plus uh, 25.5 dBm. So that actually is the OIP3 or the uh, OIP3 of this amplifier and to know the IIP3 uh, all you have to do is uh, subtract the gain from it and we know that the gain is actually about 17 dB so the IIP3 is equal to 25.5 minus 17 and that's approximately about plus uh, whatever about 8 dBm so that's the IIP3 so this is uh, with this we have actually characterized all about almost everything to do with this amplifier and we know exactly how it works if you drop it into a circuit whether it's a transmitter or a receiver we know how it will operate and we'll be able to judge uh, how the distortion products are going to be, how much gain there is going to be, and how good the match is between the circuits which follow it and the circuits which precede it. I hope that this, uh, although exhaustive and intense, but nevertheless, this was a fun video. And uh, the key thing really here is that I am now completely addicted to the Antuino. Uh, this is a plug. Uh, we sell this stuff for $100 on hfsignals.com, but I really encourage you to build this yourself. It's a very simple circuit with about, you know, it's based on an uh, Arduino uh, and SI5351, which you can buy separately from Hans QRP Labs and just about, I think, another two transistors. That's all. So it's a very simple circuit inside. We'll uh, deal with the other um, users of Antuino later, but for now, uh, 73 and have a great time.